Good morning, everyone. It's great to see you all. Today is week two of our sermon series, Abide, the Power and Beauty of God's Word. And as Pastor Bruce mentioned last week, our theme this year is all about abiding in Jesus and in His Word. And all these sermons with the same titles are being preached all around the world by our Every Nation Global Family of Churches to start the year. And today's sermon is titled, The Word Gives Life. Before I get into the message, I want to share with you for a few minutes why I find the Bible to be so amazing. Psalm 138, verse 2. It's one of my favorite verses in the Bible, and it's been that for a long time. It says, You have exalted above all things your name and your word. It says, God has exalted his name and his word above all things. God's word is supreme. His word is beautiful and it's powerful and it's beyond compare. You know, even from a secular perspective, the Bible is the most sold book of all time. Over 5 billion copies have been sold. And perennially, it's the most sold book and read book all around the world. It's not just an influential book in Europe or, or America, but it has reached every corner of the earth because it's Christianity by far is the most geogra uh, geographically and ethnically diverse faith in all the world. And in, in terms of influence on society, there's no book that can compare. The Bible has impacted the arts, the sciences, philosophy, music, literature, ethics, law, you know, being a lawyer myself, the Ten Commandments has had such profound influence on the way we understand law, ethics, and morality. So there's just nothing that compares to the impact of the Bible, and it's been so well preserved that its integrity and authenticity are simply unmatched. I say all this just to say to you that the Bible is reliable, trustworthy, and true, yeah. Yeah. that we can bet our lives on, on this, this book. Just as the Psalm says, it is supreme. It's, he has exalted his word highly above all things. Sadly, scripture often takes a back seat in society today, even among churches. There's so many churches where people want to find power in programs or in talented people or even in music and things to just kind of evoke our emotions. But God says that would be a big mistake and we have to resist that temptation because God's power has been deposited in his word. Even when listening to a sermon, and previously when I used to preach a lot more before Pastor Bruce arrived, I would try to come up with like a moving story that would just grip your emotions. And I would be kind of tempted to just do that even if there's no real gospel or no word in there. But I've come to realize that that is really not how God wants us to preach the word. And that's why I'm so thankful that Pastor Bruce is here. He's so faithful to preach the purity of God's Word. Now, there's nothing wrong with touching and moving stories that make you laugh and cry and evoke heartwarming, fuzzy feelings. We all love those things, and I, I'm, I love that too. But if you really want life transformation, if you want power in your life, and you want eternal life welling up within you, then there's only one thing that, get, that gives you that, which is God's Word. Amen. We need to consistently feed on God's truth. And how it's, it's through the word, the eternal truths of an immortal God, the creator of the universe, who has chosen to give us his power through the word. And when we read his word, we take in his values and we conform ourselves to be more like him to the glory of the Father. So my hope for 2022, in line with this theme that we have of abiding in his word, is to be the most Bible-loving church in Taiwan. I mean, why not us? Let's not aim for mediocrity and hit it. You know, let's aim for something really noble, an ambition that we can be the first to say, Lord, your servant is listening. Speak to us. When God comes into Taiwan and he wants to give a word, maybe about the future, maybe about what he's doing in, in, this, in this land, that we would be receptive because we know the word so well inside and out that we can discern the gray areas because of the wisdom, because we're so familiar with his voice and we will be blessed. Can you go to the next slide? As a church, we've already been reading the Bible together for some time on the Bible app. 
A few of us finished the entire Bible last year with this Bible project plan. And this year, I'm really pleased to say that about 70 of us representing over 15 nations, I think all six continents are represented. And we're going through the New Testament together. And my thinking is if just even half of us finish this plan, our church will be transformed. And imagine if all of us finish it or finish most of it, just imagine the spiritual growth and maturity and the power, the ability to minister to other people, to be salt and light in Taiwan that we will have. I believe that our main job, maybe my main job, now that I'm not preaching much anymore, my main job is to make disciples. And I can't think of a better way to do that than studying God's Word together with all of you. And as Pastor Bruce mentioned last Sunday, the whole point of studying the Word is not just to gain head knowledge of the Bible, but it's to encounter the living author of the Bible and to get to know God Himself. This year, except Ava, my whole family is doing this plan. <laughs> Even Caleb, my nine-year-old, set up an account last year, and I didn't learn of this until recently, but he started randomly friending people on the Bible app, including Romel. So there's a picture of Romel. This is his profile picture on the Bible app. For those of you who don't know Romel, he was our lead elder when my family moved to Taiwan in 2015. He works for Intel and he, he moved to Tokyo a few years ago. But in 2018, when Pastor Casey first asked me to start leading this congregation, I told Romel, I'll be the CEO and do all the work, but I really need you to be the chairman of the board. I, I can't do this without you. I need your wisdom because he's such, he was my role model for what an elder should be. Very caring, very uh, loving to, to people. And so I was, I was uh, surprised that when Caleb started to highlight Bible verses on the app, create Bible verse images, Romel was like liking all of them. <laughs> but Caleb couldn't remember him. So one day he went to Jalen and said, Mom, there's this guy on a bike who keeps liking all my activities. <laughs> he likes everything that I do. Well, I, I was thinking maybe Romel can help me disciple Caleb because Caleb has been he has his mis mischievous side, so if you look at the next slide, one day he decided to change his profile name to X Beast. I am a mighty beast. I don't know what that's about. But before the profile name change, he made some amusing comments. Look at the next slide, he says, Jesus is here, but we can't see him. <laughs> Which is true and profound in ways he may not have intended. But for those of you guys who are in the plan with us, please be patient, because I know he likes to make some strange comments sometimes. Now my second son, Joshua, he has also become a very prolific commenter. This is his day one comment. He wrote, the verses 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 are about the Bible and how important it is. I need to read the Bible in my darkest moments and pray when my faith is insecure. When I first read this, I was like, wow, that's really impressive that my kid is, is talking about this. But then I thought, what possible darkest moments could he be referring to? Did Jalin ask him to fold the laundry or go do his homework? And he's like, oh God, I, I feel so persecuted. I'm, I'm suffering, please help me in my hour of pain. But we were not happy about his profile photo, which was him like <laughs> fighting with Caleb. So I think Jalen got a hold of him and had him change that because if you look at the next slide, he changed it to what looks like him praying. <laughs> so that's, that's my family for you. As for Jacob, who, sitting here in the front row, I don't want to embarrass him, but I'm so proud of him because he finished reading the entire Bible two years in a row. So yeah. We're now encouraging him to really take the next step of applying the word in wisdom and abiding. And I'm, I'm so thankful that there's a lot of commenting activity so he can learn and gain the wisdom of the older brothers and sisters, uncles and aunties, and that he would also be able to contribute some comments like this. You know, he wrote, the reason we study the word is not just to read it, but to be able to use and apply it so we know how to fend off the temptations of the devil. Why am I telling you all this about my kids? It's to show you that if my silly kids can do it, anybody here can do it. Yeah. <laughs> Except maybe Riley there. She probably can't do it. <laughs> She's only like two years old. 
but I'm just loving that collectively, as a church, we are becoming more Bible-centered. And we're engaging with one another, another and encouraging each other. Let me show you a few more comments really quickly to show you what I mean. Mark, who is in the U.S., like Pastor Bruce just mentioned, wrote, All scriptures inspired by God. How blessed are we to have the word of God with us. I pray I won't take his word lightly and will always cherish what he teaches me in his word. It is true that his word is life, which is my sermon title today, that the word is life. Next one is Denise, who's here for... I'm sorry, I, did, I, didn't, I don't mean to put you on the spot there, but I really like this comment she wrote in the beginning. You know, she quoted John 1.1, 1, 1, and then she said, Knowing the Word is knowing God, praying for a year of growing our understanding in God's words. And finally, there's a day one comment from Lynn, who just left for a month or so to, to the Philippines. She wrote, I'm excited to grow with you and learn from all of you this year, praying for understanding of the Word that will result in deeper intimacy with God and obedience to His call. Amen. This is what Christian family is all about. When we meditate on God's word, we will get more of him in us and our values, our work ethic, our perspectives. It will become more like his. And all of that is to the glory of the Father. Now that was a long intro, so let me get into my message today. And I'm going to do what Pastor Bruce did last week and ask all of us to stand up for the reading of his word. It comes from John Chapter 5, verses 19 through 29. So let's read together. So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, that the Son does likewise. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all that he himself is doing. And greater works than these will he show him, so that you may marvel. For as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whom he will. For the Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son. That all may honor the Son, just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to execute judgment, because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out, those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. All right, you may be seated. <laughs> I wasn't sure if there were any more verses. <laughs> I was telling Pastor Bruce yesterday as I was preparing for this message that this passage is so rich, I just couldn't figure out how I'm going to do justice in, in one message. But I decided to keep it simple and broke it down to three main points. The first point is that Jesus is perfectly one with the Father. Jesus, if you look at it in like a mathematical formula, Jesus equals God. The Son equals the Father. This is the first and most important point. This was a radical claim at the time among the Jews, as you could imagine, and it's a radical claim even today. The idea that God himself would take on flesh and enter into our world is just mind-blowing, right? And the fact that this person, this actual historical person, Jesus, was 100% human, but was also 100% divine. That's just radical. And if you're new to Christianity, or unfamiliar with what Christianity teaches, this is going to, you're going to struggle with the implications of that message. But in this passage that we're reading, Jesus makes it very clear. The context is he had just healed a lame man on the Sabbath, invoking authority from heaven and creating a lot of controversy. And verse 18, the verse immediately preceding what we just read, says that Jesus himself claimed equality with God. 
who would make such a radical claim? You would either have to be crazy or a liar, or it would have to be true. We get to verse 19 and see how it begins. If you go to verse 19, truly, truly, I say to you. Every time Jesus says truly, truly, and he did it throughout his ministry, it means he's about to drop some truth on you and you better pay attention. When he's about to say something really important, he, do, he does this. He says, truly, truly, and I'm going to tell you something that, you, that may be difficult for you to accept, but I'm, I'm speaking the truth. And he said that phrase th three times just in the passage we just read. If you look at verse 19, it says that there is 100% perfect alignment between the Father and the Son. <laughs> The son does nothing on his own, but only what he sees the, the father doing. And then from the father's vantage point, if you look at the next verse, it, it also shows that he doesn't withhold anything from the son. He doesn't hide anything. They're just completely in unison about everything that they go about doing, that their business is completely aligned. And that's difficult, right, for any two people to be so perfectly aligned, but that is how the father and son are. They are in perfect unity. Even in the power to raise the dead and give life, they share that power, father and son. So just as God the Father is the source of all life, Jesus the Son is the Lord of life. So again, this is the first key point, that Jesus is equal to God in nature, in worth, and in authority, Jesus is perfectly one with the Father. He is God. Which leads me to my second point. He has, Jesus has all authority. Not only is Jesus one with the Father, the scripture says that the Father has given to Jesus all authority to judge. Why is this? In, in verse 23, it says that it's so that all may honor the Son, just as, as they honor the Father. This is how much the Father loves the Son. That if you dishonor the Son, you're dishonoring the Father. That Son, Jesus, His representation on the earth was to be worshipped and revered. And so all authority was given to Him. This idea is repeated in verses 26 and 27. It says, As the Father has life in Himself, so He has granted the Son to have life in Himself too. There is life in Jesus Christ. In verse 27, it says, Jesus has authority to execute judgment. Why? It says, Jesus says, it's because he is the Son of Man. That's an interesting phrase, right? And we could go in, in, in detail about what that means, but we don't really have a lot of time for, to do that. But some people might think, okay, Jesus is a Son of God, and he is a Son of Man, which was the preferred title that he re referred to himself as. And so it might be easy to think, okay, Jesus was talking about his divinity when referring to Son of God and his humanity in the Son of Man. But if you look in Daniel 7, if you look up what Son of Man actually means, it was a title not given to any ordinary human being. It was for someone that God would appoint to have dominion over the kingdoms of the world. Son of Man is a title that is divine, that is appointed by God. So this is why... Jesus says, because I am the Son of Man, I have the authority to execute judgment. He is going to rule and judge the entire world someday. And also, the Son of Man is a reference to Ezekiel 37, which I'm going to get into toward the latter part of this message. So the important thing that I want you to note here is that Jesus himself declared that he is the Son of God and the Son of Man. He has all authority, all authority under heaven and earth has been given to him. Jesus is the ruler of the universe. That means he holds your life and my life in the palm of his hand. And if you belong to him, if you believe in him, we can fully trust that he's going to take good care of us. No matter what hardship you're going through, what sickness you, you might be suffering from, what financial problem, whatever burdens you have, whatever sin that you're struggling with, that you feel so guilty and heavy laden by, Jesus can wipe away all those things. He can take care of them, and he wants to take care of them because he loves you. And he wants to give you eternal life. Which brings me to my final point. 
Jesus gives life to everyone who hears his word and believes. This point is so important to Jesus that he mentions it twice in rapid succession. And each time he does that, in verses 24 and 25, he uses that phrase again, truly, 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 I'm telling you that if whoever hears my word and believes the Father who sent him has eternal life. He's passed over from death to life. You're not going to come into judgment because Jesus has plucked you out from death to life. Jesus is the judge. Who wants to stand in judgment under a perfect judge like him, whose standard of righteousness is absolute perfection? Can any of us even come close to that standard? Thankfully, Jesus offers this amazing good news. All we have to do is hear his word and believe. And then we're not condemned, but we have eternal life. And as if Jesus didn't make this point clear enough, like I said, Verse 25, he says again, Truly, truly, I say to you that an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. This means this, there's this, this kind of paradox of the already and not yet. But I'm not going to get into that in this moment. But what this is saying is even if you experience a physical death, even if you die in this world and, and you're buried, there will come a time when if you know Jesus, if you believed in him, you've heard his word, you will hear his voice, and you will be raised up to life, and you will live. This is almost like a foreshadowing of the resurrection power of Jesus, right? So this is, again, Jesus emphasizing this, this so much, how important it is that we need to hear his voice. Because if we don't hear his voice, then we're not going to live. There's a later, past, later verse that says that there's a different kind of voice when everybody does come back to life, but then the, those who, are, who did evil are going to be judged. They're going to come back to life to experience judgment. But this hearing the voice here is the voice calling his people to rise and live. Putting it all together, this is what I'd like you to take away from today's message. Jesus has life in himself. There's eternal life within Jesus. And everyone who hears his word and believes the Father receives eternal life. They have passed from death to life and will not face judgment. Though they may die, they will again hear his voice and be raised from the dead to everlasting life. As we process these words, I want to invite anyone here who has never taken that step. You may have heard this gospel message and you've never truly believed. I want to give you that opportunity and encourage you to take that step and to do so, to believe in Jesus and to surrender your life and say, Lord, I want to believe in you. And then you can come to any of our leaders and get a Bible in your hand and start reading and breathing in those words of life so that you can live. God loves you so much. Like Pastor Bruce was saying during the offering, John 3.16, he sent his one and only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. Before we wrap up, I want to talk about the connection between hearing God's voice and having eternal life. This actually goes all the way back to the creation account. Do you guys, know how, do you guys remember how Adam was created? Genesis 2-7 says, Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and the man became a living creature. So we're made of dust, but God breathed into our nostril, or to Adam's nostril specifically, and then that breath of life went into him and caused him to be a living creature. Now, interestingly, this concept, this breath of life, comes up again in the New Testament, but it's in connection with God's word. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. This verse shows us that God has now breathed his breath of life into this book. And we can breathe that life in ourselves every time we open it and we read and, and receive the scriptures. We are breathing in eternal life into our soul. So you see, we're unique among all creatures on earth 
in that we can actually understand words. We can communicate with our Creator. We can breathe in His words that He's given us. And that's how God created us, to be in fellowship with us. And God's Word has tremendous power to shape us and form our identity and make us come alive. And the entire universe, in Hebrews, it says even the entire universe runs by the power of His words. Look, look at what Hebrews 1.3 says. This is talking about Jesus. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. The exact imprint, another translation I think says exact representation. The way I think of it is there's only one selfie of God in this world that has ever lived, and that's Jesus. He's like the perfect exact representation of God. That's why the Bible says don't make any idols to try to make it imitate God because that's going to come so short of who God really is but Jesus came in the flesh Jesus said this is who God is I am the son I'm perfectly in alignment with the father and his word has such power that he is upholding the universe through his word through his spoken word that's why we love the Bible so much don't you want this power and life in your life and in your family's life if you do, then the answer is really simple. Let's get into the Word. Let's study it and understand it. All Scripture is God-breathed. We need it. The Creator created us to need Scripture and His Spirit. It's not just head knowledge, but when we welcome and invite the power of the Holy Spirit in us, He makes the Word come alive. As we close, I want to show you what this looks like. Ezekiel had a vision of a pile of dry bones in a valley, and they were dead. There was no life in them. There's just a bunch of corpses. And he says that represents us. We were spiritually dead. We were like a corpse. There was no hope in us, in our own ability or power whatsoever, but we get a glimpse of the resurrection power of God that Jesus was talking about. Just listen how God assembles the dry bones back together, and then his breath of life goes into these bodies, and then they come alive through the spoken word, through prophecy. Through the, in this instance, it was through Ezekiel. But then we know because of the parallel with John 5 that it's Jesus' voice, the Son of Man. His voice is going to cause us to come alive. So you can follow me. I'm just going to read through here so I, there's no like, delay. The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of the valley. It was full of bones. And he led me around among them, and behold, there were very many on the surface of the valley, and behold, they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, you know. Then he said to me, Prophesy over these bones, and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you, and will cause flesh to come upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a sound, and behold, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. And I looked, and behold, there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and, prophet, and say to the breath, Thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, Our bones are dried up, and our hope is lost. We are indeed cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people. And I will bring you into the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people. And I will put my spirit within you and you shall live. And I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. I have spoken and I will do it, declares the Lord. This passage gives us a glimpse of the resurrection. This is our hope regarding the vision 
that we have for the sounds of revival. This is what happens when the resurrection power of God's word is spoken over his people. And we have faith to believe. See, resurrection, the way God describes it, doesn't emerge from the possibilities among the bones. I mean, these guys were completely cut off. They had no power whatsoever in their own ability to resurrect and reconstruct themselves. There was a complete bottoming out of hope. But God says that there has to be a grave before there can be a resurrection. The gospel is not something that says, like other religions, that say, you know, you're doing great, just a little bit of progress, a little bit more, and improve yourself day by day, and eventually you're going to get there if you strive hard enough. The gospel doesn't say that. What was uh, Buddha's last words was, keep striving. Jesus' last words were, it is finished. All other philosophies, worldviews say, humanity has to prog progress, make progress toward some better outcome. But God's standard is so perfect that we will never make it on our own. Instead, we surrender. The way we receive resurrection power is when we come to an end of ourselves and we just say, Lord, have your way in us. There's nothing within you or within me that can bring forth life, but God's word has been given to us. And this is such a treasure that we should not ignore. It's so foolish to think that, you know, God gave us his word and we study it, we look at it, we look at it intently, and then we walk away not believing it. We walk away just disregarding it and then don't turn back to it. That would be such a terrible mistake. Instead, because this word contains the life of Jesus, through it we can be a resurrection people. The good news is that when we are in Christ, death will not have the final word. We are, it's not about our strength or our own potential, but about God's power, which comes from his word. We're going to go into a short time of prayer, and maybe as Joanna comes up and plays some music for us, I'd like to just pray two simple prayers together. And first, I want us to pray that we're going to be the most Bible-loving, Bible-cherishing church that we can possibly be, Bible-centered church. And even that Pastor Bruce and the leaders will be so much more in tune with God's voice and His Word. Would you pray with me that we would experience the power of God's word this year, that we would abide in his word? Heavenly Father, we thank you that you've given us your word, that the word became flesh and came among us to dwell among us. And you say that if we abide in you and your words abide in us, then we could ask for whatever we wish and that you will do it for us. Lord, I pray that our church would not just be a church that loves programs and good music and good activities, good kids programs, but Lord, that we would build our foundation upon the power of your word. Second, I want us to pray that the breath of God, the spirit of God would breathe new life in all of us today. Holy Spirit, we ask for your breath of life to come upon the dry bones, to come upon these bodies that have no breath of life in us. Lord, restore us to wholeness. Restore us into a resurrection people. Wherever there is a need for healing, a need for forgiveness, a need for empowerment, Holy Spirit, come upon us even in this moment right now. And fill our hearts, Lord. Fill our hearts with your power. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.